This thing almost looks like the street map for a city. It's uh, a circuit though, so this is a super flat world where the entire floor is made of skulk sensors. And this crazy circuit is a response to another Minecraft YouTuber, Peter Zhang. The challenge is to see what you can make with just skulk sensors, wool, and sticky pistons. I interpreted that as having a super flat world of skulk sensors where you can only place wool and pistons. I do have some note blocks here, but those are just so I can turn on uh, the inputs to the machine. So that's all three inputs to this circuit on, and this is a full adder. A full adder is kind of like the Utah teapot of circuitry. It's just complex enough that to make it, you got to figure out how to make all the basic components of any kind of circuit. If we get a bird's eye view here, this circuit pretty much just does the simplest addition possible with two one digit binary numbers. The two inputs are up there, and just like for normal addition where sometimes you got to carry the one, we have an extra wire down through the middle to handle the carries. So I joined up uh, eight of these things one after the other, and this is essentially 8-bit binary addition. Uh, I did learn, unfortunately, after I built the big version, that if you fly too far away from it, this uh, the circuits here break. But essentially, this is just a circuit version of addition. What I like most about how this turned out is that you can see where the activity is on the chip. Whereas, you know, normally when you look at a CPU, it's just a black square. It'd be really cool to create a CPU that had like faint glow wherever there was circuit activity. The fun part of challenges like these, you know, where you build up like logic circuitry from stuff that wasn't designed to be logic circuitry, like dominoes or water. The fun part is that you got to figure out how to make each part of the circuit from the ground up. So I froze the game and pretty much the way skulk sensors work is that when a sound occurs near them, they'll slowly all turn on kind of like in a ringed formation, one tick at a time. So 1 20th of a second. And that continues up to seven blocks away from the noise source, I think. Yeah, and then it stops. And then after a second, the skulk sensors will turn off and the whole process can repeat. I haven't checked out the new snapshot, but I think the new skulk catalysts also have a different range. So it'll be interesting to see how those affect these kinds of circuits. Anyways, with just that property, you know enough to make a clock. You just put two things that uh, make noise when powered next to each other. I tried making like a clock of each distance and because, you know, each block of distance you move out adds one tick of delay, these clocks all have slightly different durations. It also looks like closing and reloading your world won't break these clocks, but if you fly too far away from them and their chunks unload, they will break. Oh yeah, and here's the exact shape of those rings tick by tick. We can also use wool blocks to like control which direction the sound travels in from pistons or note blocks or whatever. That lets us create like directional wires and then I guess as a byproduct also longer clocks. Anyways, for like 99% of the circuits, uh, we're just going to need these three shapes. So these are just diodes. Essentially, you have two redstone components that make noise. The right can power the left, but the left cannot power the right. Okay, so we have diodes and clocks. The next thing that you could figure out how to do is how to make a memory latch that you can turn on and off. Uh, it turns out if you position note blocks, I think seven blocks above the sound maker, they'll perfectly power just a single skulk sensor down on the surface. So you can use that to kind of create a clog. So we have a piston that'll move uh, wool in between these uh, two clock pistons. In a nutshell, it synchronizes them and then they both turn off at like perfectly the same time, so the loop stops. Then we can use the note blocks to start it up as well. I'm using a shader pack that makes the powered skulk sensors more visible. I think my favorite part about <laughs> this circuit is it looks like a little face, where when you turn it off, the little face screams. What's neat is you can almost think of like the sounds bouncing between the sound makers as like electrons bouncing uh, between atoms in an actual electrical wire. And so here, just like, you know, how our actual wires, you know, we wrap them in insulation. You can wrap these skulk wires in insulation too, so that there's no kind of like uh, cross contamination to nearby circuits. It also seems oddly like glass has no effect on the sounds movement, so uh, throughout all these builds I've just been using glass as decoration. As far as I can tell it doesn't actually change any functionality. Anyways, here I have two bits and it turns out you can actually make uh, crossings in the wires. So we can turn on uh, the blue memory latch and you know you can see we got the blue wire on. And then if we turn on the red wire, which is still off, uh, now it'll turn on. And then sure enough, we can turn off the blue wire. 
now only the red wire is on. To make this whole process faster, I've also been running the game at like four times speed. Okay, so we're like almost done with all the bare bones components we need to make. The last thing we really need to make circuitry is an inverter. And uh, it turns out this does the trick. So we have a clock that's just always on. This isn't an input. The note block here is just to like reset the clock if it turns off from being unloaded. Anyways, the input has four clogs uh, to this permanently on wire. And if we turn on the memory latch, yeah, those clogs will actually stop the signal being passed down the orange wire. Kind of using portal coloring here. So input on, output off, input off, output on. It does take a few tries to turn off the memory latches sometimes. And so once you have an inverter and diodes, you essentially can make any circuit because you have OR gates and NOT gates. So our full adder is just going to use two logic gates, which is AND gates and XOR gates. So the AND gate uh, output only turns on if both the inputs are turned on. Yeah, there we go. It does take like five seconds for signal to propagate through one of these circuits. So that full adder over there takes like a minute to do a computation. It's a horrible clock rate. And then the X OR gate just means the output is on if exactly one of the inputs is on. Right input on, output should turn on. Yep, there we go. And with all that, we got enough to do addition. So like the output is the XOR of the two input bits and the carry in, like if we, you know, carried a one from the previous digit. And then the carry out's kind of weird. We essentially output a one if at least two of the inputs uh, are turned on. And to check that, we just straight up have three AND gates, one that checks if the red and blue lines are on, one that checks blue and green, and another that checks red and green. And so right now, this circuit is essentially saying that one plus one with another one carried in is equal to one plus two. That's like the dumbest thing, but your CPU does have a circuit of this type that actually does addition inside of it. I should probably mention that modern CPUs would also have like 80, 100, I don't know, special circuits for a bunch of different specific mathematical operations. And often when you get a better CPU, what you're paying for is more specialized operations in addition to faster clock rate or whatever. Interestingly, uh, this inverter is a pretty good like example of a problem that's going on in actual physical circuit design right now. So I had to put four clogs in because when I tried to make this smaller and you know only used three clogs to stop the output line, every now and then the signal would leak through if the timing was just right. And this is straight up exactly what's going on with modern circuits. So the logic gates like inside the silicon chips in your computer, they're straight up getting so small that the number of atoms across is becoming a problem. I don't know if this is related to like quantum uncertainty, but a circuit that looks perfectly good in theory will just sometimes leak the wrong output through because of how few atoms it is wide. I guess that would mean our circuits need to be four atoms wide with skulk sensors in order to be consistent enough to not have quantum uncertainty. Not the best analogy, but a fun thought to poke at in your mind. I am super bummed that I don't get to demonstrate this math fact here because the full adder 8-bit version gets broken by unloading. It's so big. But essentially, because there's three on or off inputs to this full adder circuit, there's two to three or eight different possible inputs it could receive. So a fun challenge with an 8-bit adder is to see if you can come up with two numbers where when you have the circuit add those two numbers, the eight adder circuits within this thing will each have one of the eight different possible inputs. So it's kind of like a single operation that tests every part of the circuit. By the way, big circuit making companies would actually have uh, people on their testing teams trying to optimize math like this. That's all I got on these things. My name's Chris. Thanks for watching.